list. Uh, we recently bought a backhoe, and that means we now will have the unlimited ability to filter our dirt, which has been a huge bottleneck for our water project and um, other things around the homestead. And we're it's, it's really important that we have this ability, and so part of that is getting our Grizzly fixed. We've repaired the Grizzly once. We did what we call Grizzly 2.0. And we made a bunch of really key changes to it, including changing the angle of the Grizzly. We did a video on it. And we also raised it up. We raised the deck of the Grizzly up. Those two changes really helped a lot. The problem is we're dropping 300 pound rocks on this poor wooden Grizzly. And I thought, we had a friend come over who saw one of our plumbing videos and said, I have to go help these people. They're going to kill themselves. He was very generous, came over, and he helped me dig the Grizzly out from the rock pile. In doing so, I realized I don't think we're going to be able to make some repairs to it. Once we dug this thing out of the pile here, I realized that the chain link was a really good upgrade. You can see the really small rocks that it's filtering out. This brace we installed, well, honestly the brace was junk. It turned out to be a rotten piece of wood. And a lot of the stuff that we used to build this, minus the deck, was reclaimed wood. We never intended for this stuff to be bulletproof. We just wanted to get the job done. But we have so much more dirt to filter. This mound back here is probably eight feet tall. We need to filter a lot of that. Those rocks right there are probably 200 pounds a piece. A lot of this needs to be filtered. And this is actually going to be the location of our home. And so we're gonna have to excavate this out. And we wanna save a lot of that to backfill for the footings and for the slab but I don't want to backfill with rocks like that. So I want to get a better Grizzly built to help us with this. Because we use a lot of just deck screws to hold this floor together, they're all bent and removing them is quite a nightmare. It can be done and we'll dismantle this and use it for something else. But I thought, you know, for the amount of time that I'm gonna put into trying to get this thing taken apart and repaired, I might as well actually salvage a couple of pieces off of it and build a whole new Grizzly. So I've got the lumber over here to start building a new one. One of the main improvements that we wanna make is to open this up so that you can get in here with a tractor and scoop up the filtered soil. So a big part of what I need to do, oh hey Bugaboo, have you been out in the sun today? Oh, you've been really hot, huh? Yeah, it's cooling down, huh, so we can work on the Grizzly. Huh? Are you going to help me with the Grizzly? In the interest of making the workflow better, we need to do some work on getting some bracing up here. And so I may end up using some plywood and some things to help with the bracing. Bugaboo is really vocal right now. So we're going to work on that so that we can get in here and grab the soil. And so we don't have to constantly move the Grizzly. One of the things that's hurt the Grizzly the most is having to move it. So we've been hooking on here with a chain looping it through here and lifting. But usually in the front, we've got rock piled up, maybe this high. And this is why this is all damaged and torn out here on the bottom. One of the glaring weaknesses of this deck is that the, I'll call them joists, are basically not tied together. So they're free spanning from the rim joist to rim joist, which is a, an especially weak design. So I think for the next design, we're actually going to block these uh, joists so that they're attached, which will help them to resist all the loads when we're dropping rocks on them. These bolts up here um, did not do well getting rocks and buckets and things smashing them, so they're all bent. This joist is broken. I'm going to give a little bit of thought to how to strengthen that upper corner up there. We may end up using something uh, across here like a diagonal brace that will create some rigidity in here to resist racking on this. I think that may be kind of what torqued this um, that way. And then also, I mean, doing something up here to brace along the top of these two to create some stability within the frame itself. Lots to work on. Bugaboo clearly wants to help me get started. So let's go lay out some of this stuff. I picked up this new uh, kind of carpenter apron and I'm really excited to try it out. Um, with the home build coming, I think we're gonna be doing a lot of this type of work with a lot of hand tools and things. And uh, I saw a couple people have them. They've got a lot of hammer loops, nail pockets, 
you know, uh, pencil pockets, stuff like that, place for your tape measure. So kind of fun to see how this works on this project. One thing we did learn at the timber frame workshop was sharpen your pencil. Alyssa and I had been making a lot of mistakes and a lot of our stuff is off when we cut it because we're not aggressive enough with sharpening our pencil. So something we learned is that when it really matters, you need to mark with a knife so that it's precise enough. Even the width of a pencil can actually make a difference in the quality of whatever you're building. Another improvement we're going to make is something I probably should have done the last time, and that is to put hangers underneath these joists. So these hangers we actually got almost two years ago through this monster um, reclaim materials find we had. We've got all kinds of things from, uh, you know, direct pour in post holders, bolt down post holders, four by stuff. But I think there's a bunch of two by six hangers in here. And uh, you know, what a great use for these things. Um, since we're building a timber frame, we're not going to need a lot of this stuff. So it's kind of just sitting around taking up space. Another improvement we're going to make is to use nails. Our other Grizzly was built using screws. And screws are really good for holding things tight, but they do not have a very high shear strength. And so with this one, we're gonna go pretty much nail crazy. Nailing on our hangers and nailing each component together. And then whatever we decide to do to triangulate this stuff to resist shear and um, racking, we'll probably use nails there too, which will give us lots of shear strength, something that the screws just completely do not have. They just snap right off. Well, I just learned a really valuable lesson, and that is to always double check your lumber before you start building. I guess I forgot that one. I assumed, fatal assumption that all these boards would be the same length because I bought them from the same unit of lumber and I guess that's building 101. So I now get to disassemble just a little bit and go back through and make these pieces uniform. I have to say that was actually one of the problems with our other Grizzly is that when we built it we did not do all that double checking and so we had some boards that had a very small gap because they were shorter than the other boards. And that of course put more stress on the screws, which of course blew them up. So yet again, I'm going to practice my patience and quality control on this project. And so we've got a little bit of cutting to do. That went really good. Got all the joists attached using nails and all the hangers attached. And now we need to actually put in blocking. And what blocking does is it transfers the load from one joist to the peripheral joists. Our old Grizzly, we didn't do that. So if you dropped a 200 pound rock on that joist, it had to bear that entire load. And that's part of why the whole thing just started failing. Typically when you build a floor, you would actually put what's called blocks in. And those blocks actually transfer the load to the adjacent joist. So if you dropped 200 pounds on this joist, it's not bearing the whole load. The joists next to it are carrying some of that load too. And it also creates some racking rigidity, etc. So let's get those put on there. Well, that's a pretty productive evening. You know, it's funny, as I was working on this blocking, I'm like, ah, crap. See, I screwed up already. I was originally going to take those two two by sixes there, space them out about three and a half inches here, run them lengthwise, and then block 
between them and then between this outer joist here. But you know, I've been thinking about this and one of the weaknesses of our current Grizzly is that the screws, all that holds this rim uh, joist onto this rim board is screws that come in from this side. So it's the threads. And of course, as all that rock and all that stuff hits the bottom of this board, it pops that board off. On top of that, all the rock that usually accumulates here on the bottom, I'm gonna stop and say this because I know somebody's gonna comment this. This is upside down, folks. This will be rotated over so the hangers are oriented correctly. So the rock accumulates on the bottom and then you go to lift the Grizzly out and it yanks this bottom board off. And I think the problem there is that we're using the shear strength of of fasteners wrong. Um, so I'm thinking now that this will be up and down. And this will be more like a purlin system. So when the boards, when the rocks come rolling down, they're not going to knock this board off here because it's nailed in from the ends. And I'm thinking about putting some strapping around the ends there. And I talked about doing some triangulation here too that should really strengthen this board. And in order to knock this board off, you'd have to shear the nails or pop the nails out here, which is far less likely than if you just pop the nails out the end, just like that. I'm gonna give this a little bit of thought tonight because it's getting late. Alyssa's got dinner almost ready. She's been hard at work on video. I've been burying her in fun projects. So I'm gonna think about this one overnight and make a decision if I wanna go with my more of a purlin system or stick with the joist system. And then I need to do some more thinking about how to triangulate the deck here to give it a lot more strength. I don't think it'll be that complicated. We've got some scrap plywood laying around that would make really great triangles if we can find a place to put them in there so that the rocks don't accumulate. So I'm gonna pick this video up another day. Well, it's a beautiful morning and it's supposed to get pretty scorching hot today again. So I'm going to jump on this Grizzly project and see how much progress I can make. I think I can get it finished today. One of the major contributing factors to the bottom rim blowout, I mentioned that earlier, was weight of rocks and things, but there's no real triangulation here. So there's no, no resisting forces, which makes this board more than willing to bend like this. And of course that puts stress on the screws and they blow out. Um, triangulating this would definitely help. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to doing that. I've, I've not come up with a great idea for that just yet, other than maybe to put some sort of brace across here and then down here, something like that which would triangulate all of these joists across each other, which would make that nice and rigid. I might try though, putting a box on the outside of this brace and this brace here. So on our new Grizzly, if I box the ends, that box is going to have a tremendous amount of rigidity this way, which is how that board wants to bend. It wants to bow like this under all that pressure. By boxing it, you get the strength of this vertical board, which provides a lot of strength for the, for the, for the weight of the rocks. And then by putting a box on the end, you're going to have a lot of resistance for the motion of the rocks this way that are likely to try to pop those nails off. It's going to take a little extra wood, but I've got some wood on the sawmill that I really need to get milled up. The sun is starting to have an effect on it. And then I've been pondering this, which way to orient this. And I, and I want to try this. So I think in order to increase my odds of success, I'm actually going to block 16 on center. Right now, this is on 32 on center. And I'm gonna just go ahead and put another block, a row of blocks, which will give me the strongest grid. It's starting to get heavy though. But I think that's going to really strengthen this whole thing. We're going to have a post in these four corners, which means I'm going to need to do a block over here to attach the post. And then probably some sort of block in here to attach that block to the middle block. And that'll transfer all that weight in that corner, uh, kind of distribute it around so we don't get the blowout like we did on our other Grizzly. Right now, it's time to make wood. A couple weeks ago, Alyssa and I retrieved a monster uh, tamarack tree, a larch tree from a neighbor's property, and we got it cut into a beam. But I've got all this slab wood that's been sitting on the mill here probably for a couple of weeks, haven't had time to deal with it. And it's starting to cup a little bit from sitting in the sun. And this wood would be perfect for this stuff. Um, anything we can make that's two by six 
is pretty practical because we're going to be building a lot of concrete forms and doing a lot of concrete strapping and things. And we actually do have a few 2x6s over there already that we can use. Um, so let's turn some of this stuff into uh, 2x6 material. I'm kind of sad about making a 2x6 out of this. It's such good wood, but the wane starts pretty quick there. So we might actually leave this like a two by eight or something like that down here and we'll get two by sixes out of this stuff where the wane is down there. There you have it. We uh, yielded five two by six. Good looking, good looking pieces of wood. Not bad for about 30 minutes worth of work. So there's not much we're gonna take off the old grizzly, but the rear legs are something that we wanna reuse. So we're, Alyssa and I are gonna work together to salvage those. I got pretty far on this project today, but the heat is starting to build. So I think it's time to move indoors. I think I'm realizing that this is gonna be an, end up being a two-part series uh, because it's getting to be pretty long. And the next stage is gonna be pretty lengthy too. It was worth the effort to salvage those four by fours. We already had them. It'll save us a little bit of money. We got pretty far on disassembling the old Grizzly. Um, we'll be able to salvage a lot of that wood to use for concrete forms and things like that because it's got a lot of screws, broken screws and nails in it. So we don't want to use it for anything that we would have to cut it with. Um, so the next stage is building the foundation. And I've got some ideas to make the foundation way more practical. One of the things that really damaged this, like I said earlier, was moving it. And I've got an idea to build a box, plywood, inside the Grizzly, where you can scoop the soil out instead of having to move the Grizzly. So we'll kind of set up a processing area. But that's for another video. I'm super glad the sawmill was out here. We could throw together some lumber. Turned out really good. We got to use some stuff that we needed to get used up anyway. This project is a lot of fun, and I think for those folks out there who are economically minded, a couple of things. The reason we're not building this out of metal is we don't have metal, first of all, uh, so we have to purchase it. We have wood, we have nails, we have the brackets, so a lot of what we do around here is an exercise of using what we have. The other reasons are working with metal. We don't have the tools to do that. Our neighbors do, but it's not something that we feel like we can readily access. So welding, cutting, stuff like that. We have the ability to cut metal, but we don't have the ability to uh, attach things easily. We have wood, simple. And then the final reason, and probably the most important reason that we're not using metal is weight. We need to be able to move this grizzly with the equipment that we rent. and. We usually rent an excavator and we also rent a backhoe. We just purchased a backhoe and we need to be able to move it with that backhoe. And I do not want to be toting around a 2,000 pound grizzly. Uh, as this one's built, I'll bet it probably weighs around 600 pounds, a little bit more than that, maybe. Um, and that's the main reason. So thanks for joining me for this one. I'll see you on the foundation. We're back to the grizzly project. The weather has given us a little bit of a break. It's only about 80 degrees out here right now and in the shade it's feeling pretty nice. So what I like to do is get to work uh, building a new foundation for the Grizzly. Uh, in case it's the first video you're watching, 
uh, I decided with our old Grizzly over here to just kind of retire it. It's got so many bent and mangled screws. A lot of the boards are cracked or fractured. The design was more of a validation than it was kind of a final product. And we went through a couple patches just to get jobs done, to get certain projects done because we had equipment rented. But we're kind of gearing up to start the foundation of our house and uh, we want to filter all that soil. A friend of ours, a neighbor, Richard, came over with his tractor and he was willing to filter the soil and we got to looking at the grizzly and said, she's done, it's over, time to start new. So. Spend a little bit of time and use the sawmill, cut some lumber, use some lumber we already had. And we've this time used nails to build the deck. We're 16 on center with our joist and we're also 16 on center with all of our blocking. Everything is two by six. In the other Grizzly, we had a mixture of two by six and two by four. And finally, we've actually added uh, joist hangers and now we need to build the frame that the deck is going to sit on and I've got a few ideas uh, About how to make that deck even better our first iteration of Grizzly This is the deck here was actually sitting on the ground And we always had this problem where the rocks would start to accumulate and it would start to weigh it down Of course getting those rocks off there without damage in the Grizzly was pretty hard So in Grizzly 2.0 we actually added legs to the front and raised the front off the ground uh, to two feet and that also uh, and we also raised the back two feet that actually gave us a steeper grizzly which was great because the rocks rolled off much quicker but there was no loss of soil everything was great there and then you had this area in front where rocks could accumulate for a little while before they started to pile up on the grizzly unfortunately we had to move the grizzly a lot because we didn't have a way to remove the soil from the back side using a tractor. So you get all these rocks that are piled up over here on the front and then you'd hook up a chain and try to lift this out and in so doing a lot of damage happened in this lower area. So what we're going to do this time with our, our uh, frame or foundation here is we're going to use bracing in the back. We're going to leave this bottom area open so we can drive in with the bucket. So what we're thinking is that this is probably going to be a kind of framed piece and we're going to use plywood as sheathing and that plywood will give us a lot of kind of shear resistance or um, racking resistance. But in order to keep the soil from just wanting to blow out the front here as you push it with the bucket, we want to create a box inside. And so this is the front and we're going to do the same thing. We're actually going to build a kind of truss inside there and we're gonna line it with plywood. So this plywood will actually be on the inside. The same thing here with the side view, this plywood will be on the inside. With the first Grizzly, I didn't do a lot of engineering. I just kinda threw together some stuff and thought we would just see if it worked. It worked and away we went. And that's a lot of that's history. With this one, I'm not, I'm not really doing engineering, but I'm doing a lot more kind of calculating. And I'll have to say that after our timber frame workshop, I have a, a much finer appreciation for for accurate measuring and accurate cutting. It's not that I didn't respect that stuff in the past, I guess I just didn't quite understand how important it was because we really haven't built a lot of stuff. Um, but the stuff we've built, we've paid for the inaccuracies and inconsistencies. So this time I'm gonna be doing more math and try to cut these pieces to a particular plan instead of kind of put this together, put this together, measure it, see if it fits. Not promising that's how it's gonna work out, but let's try it. We want this lower portion here to be two feet. And because we're gonna to have to probably use two sheets of plywood, we might as well make this two feet up here also. We know that the measurement from the um, large bolt from the top portion here to the bolt on the lower portion here is 82 inches. And we know that this dimension over here we want from the top of this wall to where this eye bolt enters to be that's 72 inches minus four so that's 68 inches because the bolt is four inches recessed from the top and we have a two foot wall here so what we're trying to solve for is how long is this wall? I went and did a couple double checks and it turns out our eye bolts are three inches recessed from the top so our side height is actually 69 inches. We can solve for this third side here because this is a right triangle and Pythagorean theorem says that a squared 
plus b squared equals c squared. So what we're gonna do is square 82 and square 69. We're gonna subtract this from this and that would give us 1963. All we have to do is get the square root of 1963 and that will give us the length of our third side. Now this is a little tricky because that's 44 inches from the center of that bolt to the center of that bolt, which are both centered on the post. So in order to find the inside dimension, we need to subtract half of the width of the post from each side. So we'll subtract three and a half inches, which means that our inside wall should be 40 and a half inches right here. As we get closer to building our house, I'm becoming more and more of a fan of having a set of plans because it removes a lot of confusion. Now, this project is fairly small in scope, and so I'm applying all these theories to this project, and I'm gonna have fun building it. But if I screw it up, it's not that big of a deal. But it really helps me to look at a set of plans and scrutinize them, something like our house plans, and start to look for problems, things that won't work, uh, miscalculations, stuff like that. So this will be interesting to see. We just did it on paper, so let's build it and see if it'll work. I think I can use a lot of this scrap wood that we pulled off the other Grizzly, but as a last resort, we've got some fresh 2x4s over at the sawmill. So we're gonna build our little knee walls, we'll call them, out of this stuff. All right, perfect. So these will be our sides. And I gotta tell you, my gut says that the math is wrong, but I'm gonna trust the math and see how this comes out. So we need to cut our front legs, which will be two feet, and then four inches of relish and our bolt will actually go through right here at the two foot mark. Oh, I forgot to mention before I get too far, the way I made these so darn quick is it dawned on me that in our storage unit, we have a pneumatic nailer or a nail gun. I totally forgot. So gosh, it's been almost two months. It was two months ago now we made a massive score on tools. If you haven't seen that video, we'll link to it over here. We had been keeping in touch with a gentleman for over a year who was getting older and he needed to sell his property. And he had built a home just like Alyssa and I are doing, but 40 years ago. And he had all these tools because he did all the work himself. I think he hired a couple people, but generally speaking, he actually did the work. So when he says he built his house, what he doesn't mean is he paid a contractor to build it. Now that he's moving on, he needs to sell the home. He wants to be closer to his kids, which was perfect for us. Mm -hmm. So the moral of that story is be patient. And one of the gold mine tools that we picked up was the nail gun. So after I Spent a little time kind of chewing through a bunch of my dad's accumulated 16 penny nails. I thought, this is way too much work. Let me grab the nail gun. I think if there's one thing this journey has taught us, it's the power of good tools. Timber framing workshop taught us the same thing. We got to do a lot of things by hand, just like how I nailed this by hand. I didn't cut that by hand, thank you goodness <laughs> thank goodness for our dewalt chop saw we did do an unboxing on that if you're curious great saw love it anyway we've learned the value of really good tools the challenge that we've seen is that it takes thousands of dollars of tools to build things quality you can do it slow which we have been doing that entire deck was built with i think maybe three power tools but here i am starting to use more and more this is looking good. I decided to put screws to hold this to the legs just in case the math was wrong. And I did just take a measurement from there to there and the math is spot on. I just don't remember this being that steep on our previous Grizzly. And I don't think it was because we didn't use math to build it. We just kind of eyeballed it, you know. Eh. So we're gonna trust the math and it's gonna give us a little bend down here that's about four feet by eight feet. So now we need to build the front section. So let's do some more measuring and then we'll get the front built. Kind of laid that support there on the deck. I guess I kind of just want to tilt it up and I want to look at it because what, what's got me hung up is this front piece right here is only going to be about 12 inches tall. I'm working in the constraints of an eight foot riser. This one right here. I can't raise it any higher without 
change in the geometry of the, the grizzly. We want the grizzly to be steep. I just don't want it to be too steep. And I also don't want the refines box to be too small so you can't get a backhoe bucket in there. That's kind of what I was worried about. It's awfully steep. I guess what I'm realizing is that on our old grizzly that the 82 inch mark, which is what we, I used this measurement. I took this off our old grizzly and I knew this measurement because I was able to calculate that based on the two foot knee wall. And on a right triangle, that's the exact measurement. I have a hunch that on our old Grizzly, this wasn't a right triangle. I think this leg was a little bit long. And so this angle wasn't actually correct mathematically. In order to make 82 inches work, we would have to raise this up and come out. I can either sit back and do some more math or we can move ahead and give this a try and see if it actually will work pretty well. I know from experience that when you drop soil in here, it definitely comes right through. But what I don't know is what effect these blocks will have. Because if you look, if you kind of think of this like a vertical space, the amount of vertical space between these blocks is very narrow. And so this may actually be too steep to work. So back to the drawing board a little bit. I spent a little time thinking about it at, oh, 55 degrees. I think this is too steep. What I chose to do was to go one foot off of this wall here higher. So we had this at two feet and I changed this height for my triangle here to three feet. And when I did my um, my Pythagorean theorem, I came up with 58 and 15 sixteenths or approximately 59 inches. Since our current wall is already 40.5 inches, I'm just going to add a 15 inch piece to that wall and that will bring us out. And then what we'll need to do is actually attach a new front leg that is three feet tall, not two. And that should put us really close to a 45 degree angle. And I feel really, really pretty good at 45 degrees. As you can see, we're losing daylight. So <clears throat> despite my best efforts, I wasn't able to complete this project today, but I did get our extensions on there. I've got the the legs over there ready to cut, but we're running out of daylight. Twilight's an amazing thing here, but it gets to the point where we can't shoot. And uh, well, I'm gonna assume you guys wanna watch the end of this project. So unfortunately our schedule for the next two to three days is booked up. So time to clean, clean up, put all the stuff away. We'll have to set this to the side. And uh, when we resume, we'll pick back up with the legs and the front. Well, I'm super happy that the Grizzly project took me a little longer than uh, I wanted, I guess. Uh, partly because our backhoe showed up today. And something I, I knew I wanted to factor into the equation was the width of our bucket. I'm assuming that by the time you watch this video, we'll have published our video about the backhoe. So if you have a lot of questions about the backhoe, look for that video. We'll link to that guy over here. Anyway, let's take a measurement off the bucket. Hey, that's really good news. So the bucket is 81 inches wide. So if you remember, these are the corners here that the legs are gonna go on. So these will be the front legs and I think those will be the rear legs. So we need the measurement off the inside there. All right, so we are 96 inches inside to inside. And then we're framing these small panels on the inside. So we're gonna take seven inches off the total width, which puts us at 89 inches. But then we're gonna have three quarter inch plywood probably on the inside there. So we're gonna take another inch and a half. So about 87 and a half inches. So I'm starting to think that maybe I ought to recess the panels, the plywood panels inside, at least on the sides. That give me just another inch and a half at 81 inches on the bucket. And I believe we had 87 and a half. That only gives you about three inches on the sides. That's actually good because that doesn't give the soil anywhere to fall off, if you know what I mean. Like it's a pretty tight little space. So I don't know. I think we're gonna try it. We're gonna push our luck. We'll put the, the sides right where they go uh, in line with the legs. And then we'll put our plywood on the inside of that. And then we'll, we'll just run the backhoe in there and we'll see if it'll pick up dirt or not. So we did a quick test fit and uh, 
I think I'm gonna go ahead and secure these panels to the sides. So I've gotta get that plywood ripped down to two foot strips and secured here and here. And then I need to do, I need to finish cutting the front and building that frame. It's working pretty good, but I'm not gonna lie. It's pretty tight with that bucket. You're not gonna really get away with trying to swing in. You're gonna have to be able to drive straight into the Grizzly. I feel like this video is taking a long time. So guess what? I think I'm gonna go with part three on this guy. Video number three, we gotta get the front board that'll complete this kind of bin area. And then we need to drill and mount the deck. And I guess before we do that, we've got to attach the uh, filter screen, which in this case is, I think, 11 gauge chain link fence. There's a slim chance I'll get to that tomorrow morning. Hope you're having fun with this one. I'm actually kind of having fun with this. It feels like it's going a little bit slow, uh, just because of the chaos of everything right now. But I have to say, and I, and I meant to mention this about five times, this Grizzly has probably saved us over a thousand dollars in soil because we have so much rock that the stuff we have here really isn't that great for strategic backfill. And since we're gonna be starting the excavation for the house very soon, we'd like to filter most of that soil. And that means that we should be able to reuse a lot of that for the fill after a lot of the footings and everything are dug and built. But without the Grizzly, we'd have to buy soil, which for us, a good load of soil is running about $180, including trucking. I'll see you on the next episode. One thing I love about summer mornings, one, at six o'clock in the morning. It's warm enough, you can just head out in a t-shirt and shorts. The other thing is all the wildlife. Squirrels, birds, everybody's busy making food for winter. And then there's this little turd. He's been on camera a lot lately. Boogaboo, do you like the new grizzly? Do you, do you like the new grizzly? Do you think it'll work? Mom, pet that. This morning, we're gonna try to get this grizzly finished up and give it a test. What we've been building is a rock separator, if this is the first video that you're joining us for. Uh, our property is covered in rock. In lieu of buying a lot of fill dirt, we have tried to create a contraption to help us uh, filter the soil that we already have. And we built a first version. It did pretty good, but it finally died. Uh, we've tried fixing it and patching it, but ultimately it was kind of flawed from the beginning. It had a lot of weaknesses and that's okay. So this time we're actually starting from the ground up and we're kind of rebuilding it using a lot of the things that we have learned from the first one. So where we're at, this is uh, episode number three or video number three. What we need to do this morning. To help finish the foundation, we need to create the tie brace that goes on the back here. And uh, we've got some plywood that was used for a concrete form. And we're going to use that to probably, we'll probably use that to cover the front here. I think we're actually, we weren't originally going to put plywood on the outside because you don't really need it. But I'm pretty confident now that for strength, we're probably going to need to sheet uh, the outside here too. And then a couple of things that we need to do to the decking here is we need to drill the holes for the posts and then we need to flip it over and attach the screen which is going to be 11 gauge chain link fence so once those things are done we should be ready to lift the deck up and install it on the grizzly and then we'll need to move the grizzly over here and give it a test run looking at our lumber pile we're running a little low on two by fours so it looks like we get to make some two by fours real quick
One unfortunate reality of reclaimed materials is that they often are fraught with nails and screws. Ironically, you collect all these materials, but then you're really limited on what you can use them for, unless you're willing to take the time to do all that extra work. It's a labor of love. You have to really want those materials because a piece of wood like this with too many nails in it will chew up a $50 saw blade and you can replace this panel for probably around 25. So just one reality of working with these materials. Well, I have to tell on myself, there's a lot of dip and dive on the left side of this board. So yesterday evening, in trying to just get a million things done, I was in a hurry, and um, I left one of the side supports up after where my board ended, so down toward the back end of the mill, which I thought, well, you know, it doesn't matter really, I'm not milling down there. Well, I milled to the end of that board, and then to give myself just a little more room to work, I pushed the mill head forward, the blade was already turned off, but it hadn't stopped yet, and it bit into one of the side supports. So, this morning I went out to mill, and I knew I had dinged the blade, but I thought I would just see if it would cut. And uh, the cut it made looks like this, dips and dives. So this morning, I had to change the blade. Let me show you what I did to that other blade. So here's a blade that's got quite a few hours of cutting on it. And as we move around, see the shift? Pointy tooth, round tooth. And I only knocked off maybe about 30 teeth out of the whole blade. This blade I don't think can even be resharpened, but I'll ask Woodmiser. It's not a big deal. I think these blades are about $20. One of the best pieces of advice a local Sawyer gave me, take your time, there's no rush. Make your right cuts the first time and don't do damage to your blades. Well, I've done pretty good, you know, but yesterday I got pretty annoyed because our to-do list it's so long and some of these things just keep getting bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped and you just got to get some work done sometimes you know and uh that wasn't like a glaring error right they never are it seems like when you make a mistake it's not like you know you leave the oven on all night or something like that it's it's something little so there i told on myself and yep it doesn't cut very good with that blade on there but thankfully the blade change takes five minutes maybe so I uh, got that done and the other side of that board is just beautiful. So I got the front paneling all installed. You can tell that used to be a concrete form. This is another reality of reclaimed materials. I mean, you're just gonna eat up saw blades. And I'm using a blade on my saw that I don't really care about, but all that concrete and mortar on that board, I guarantee you is just doing havoc, wreaking havoc on that blade. Now we're working on building this back brace up here and I've got some OSB that I'm gonna use to sheet that to try to create some rigidity. thought I'd share something really quick because there's probably somebody out there who can use this information. So you might not know, but on sheathing, there's these black lines and those are put there to save you a heck of a lot of time when you're nailing your sheathing. So some of these lines I think are, let's see, two foot on center. So from here to here is two feet, to here, two feet. So what are these lines? These are 16 on center. So if we lift this up, without dropping it, you'll see that behind those lines are studs. So now when I go to nail, all I need to do is nail up that black line. And it's a huge time saver when you're doing large projects. You could also mark those off like I was doing on some of this stuff. You can see some of my chalk lines down here, but this is much quicker.
so we're ready to drill the holes in the posts. And I know that my triangulated distance is 82 inches. So I dropped a nail up there. And what we're gonna do is I need to get my square and find the center of this post and draw a line straight down. And what we're looking for is where 82 inches intersects that line. So now we need to drill the holes in our deck and then what we're going to do is add a block on the other side so the bolt can run through and attach that block and I think we'll actually end up adding a block laterally also so a vertical block and a lateral block behind each one of these bolted areas. I want to just flip this deck over. I decided I want to put the fencing on on the ground. And uh, since we have the backhoe, I think I'm just gonna use the backhoe to give it a flip. And then we should be able just to lift it in place, but I'm gonna have to have Alyssa's help probably to get those bolts through there. I sure hope Alyssa has some breakfast ready. I haven't eaten yet and I don't even know what time it is, but we gotta go pour concrete in like two hours. So chop chop. <laughs> Alyssa has banned me from this project because morale has dropped very low. We have a lot of work to get done. But I think you can see behind me, we now have Grizzly 3.0. I don't know if I'm gonna test it in this video or not. If I'm chest, if you know what? Testing, it'll probably be the outro. Hope you enjoyed this project. See you next time.